Welcome, precious people, to the house of the Lord. You are the family of God, and you have been brought together by the Lord for his purpose and for worship, but also for the edification and building up of, and encouragement of one another in the body of Christ. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And as we uh, enter the presence of the Lord, we receive his grace anew this day. Three verses print, uh, projected, Isaiah 53, 4 down through 6. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's remain standing if you're able, for and can it be beautiful hymn of praise and wonder. And can it be that I to be called the children of God, for establishing in us your wonderful grace and salvation, the blood of Christ applied to us, our righteousness, because he is righteous for us. We thank you, Lord, for this day in which we remember, we celebrate, and we look ahead to our final redemption. In Jesus' name, amen. Please uh, be seated. And we're going to have Aiden come at this time and read the scripture projected. You can follow along as Aiden reads. Yes. Wait, wait, wait. It's right here. Right here. I'm over here. Okay. All right. Yeah. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, 
the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness, 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 it, and to purify himself, uh, people that are his very own eager to do what is good. Amen. Thank you. We appreciate your enthusiasm, too. That is so good to hear. Thank you. Wow. We have this beautiful hope just smashed right together in these verses that you can take with you. Titus 2.11 and 14. And the good news is not just for us, but for around the world. And so at this time, we're going to have... Uh, Right, a volunteer for the Christmas in October fund right here, and a volunteer for the building fund right here. We need another volunteer. Oh, Aiden's up here already. Okay, so you are the building fund. You are the Christmas in October. And if you have, uh, are ready to contribute today, a special offering, and uh, then you can make your way up while we begin singing some of our courses. Okay, so just remind them, your Christmas in October and your building fund. Okay. And for real. For real. Yeah. <laughs> for real. For real. All right, Janelle. Start us out here. Blessed be the Lord. Oh, 
song from the 21st century or we have a song from the 18th century, Amazing Grace, so relevant even right today. Think about, uh, you know, John Newton, the former slave uh, ship captain that brought over slaves from Africa, captured them and like that, yet understood his condition and dependence upon Jesus. We get to enter right into that. Once we too did not see properly, but now, now we are found. Now I see. Let's sing one, two, and the uh, three, and the last. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. someone else knows that, get up, share with one another, with one another, the grace that you have received, the love from God. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. Well, we have a 
chance to read the Word of God together, let's stand for Matthew chapter 26, 20, 36, excuse me, through 46. Matthew, we're going through this section here, the last days before the, the last day before the crucifixion. So let's read Matthew uh, 26, 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell face down to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. You may be seated. Thank you. God add his blessing to the word of God at this time. Now, we have been through a great storm, and some of you have been through misery, actually, of many days, some in our congregation, a whole week without power. Why do, you know, it brings up the question, why does humanity have to suffer in this way? So much that we go through, whether it's through sickness or through uh, distress or uh, uh, persecution or great storm just doesn't seem to make sense in light of all that God being a good God, a God that loves us. Why does humanity have to suffer? Well, the truth of the matter is that we cannot answer that question this morning. The Bible doesn't let us in on all of those things. Even Job, who had to go through great suffering, was not allowed even to know that the, that the enemy, Satan, had and, and the Lord had this conversation about Job. He wasn't allowed to know that God permitted all this to take place to Job's life. And Job would pass the test and be faithful. God knew it. But Job was not allowed to know why he was suffering, and yet he made it through that time of suffering, as faithful was. And as difficult as that is for us, why do people have to suffer and just have to let that out there and we live by faith without knowing the answer? And that may not be satisfying to many people, but we don't have it. But what we do have in Scripture is why did Jesus have to suffer? And we may have a clue about why humanity suffers by looking at what Jesus has to go through. Our passage that we've just read had unfolded so much of the suffering of Jesus, and Luke explains in even more detail that as Jesus went there into the Garden of Gethsemane and suffered, and he felt the anguish of that separation between father and son. And uh, 
take this cup, yet not as I will, but thy will be done. And his sweat was as like great drops of blood. Luke tells us of that. Matthew explains three times that he prayed for three hours, and the disciples could not keep up with this. And Jesus said, watch and pray, but they could not. Jesus suffered in a very dramatic way that is really beyond description. The Bible just kind of explains that this is what was happening to him on the outside, but we have no idea of all the horror that was going on as he faced the crushing weight of sin of the world being placed on him. It was a very dreadful thing that only Jesus had to do to suffer that. But we don't have to guess, even though we don't have Matthew or the Gospels to explain it. We have later writing of the New Testament writers that explain why Jesus had to go through all this agony. We don't have why we have to suffer, but we do have why Jesus had to suffer. And so today, as we've read through I just want to tell you that there are probably a thousand sermons in this passage. There are so many good things, so many things that we could explore, like uh, the Lord teaching us to pray, uh, your will be done, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here Jesus is saying, not my will, but thine. Jesus unfolds for us the way through temptation. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. And it was not just about then, but it's about the second coming. A thousand sermons, I believe, are right in these passages, uh, these verses here. But what I would thought we would do today is really explore the purpose. Why did Jesus have to suffer? And we don't have to guess about this. And it unfolds in the different writers and the different eyewitnesses were there as they explain in different passages. So let's go through these. And, and we could put it down to three words. In your place. If you don't take anything away, take that away. He suffered in your place. So let's just take a few of these. Apostle John, we know he was right there. We hear it. He was one of the sons of Zebedee. Jesus took the wrath of God against sinners. He took it on right in that time as he faced the death and uh, uh, the crucifixion, but also the suffering time. Look at what the Apostle John wrote later on in the Gospel of John chapter 11. He had this insight and, and witnessed there of what the high priest said that Jesus would die for the whole Jewish nation. And the high priest, though not a believer, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, that is, for the people group of the Jews, those then, those today, that they might be saved. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. The people of God, you are invited to become children of God because the wrath of God is removed from you because Jesus has taken it upon himself. He took what was for you. He took it for you. He suffered for you in your place. The wrath of God is revealed against sin and all sinners. So that's the first thing. He took the wrath of God against sinner. If Jesus does not take the wrath of God away from you, what's going to happen? You're destroyed forevermore. That's the alternative. The wrath of God brings about destruction. But the gift of God is eternal life. So you can either have eternal death or you can have eternal life. Jesus took the wrath of God, and it's removed. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, the second thing is that Jesus had to suffer in obedience to the will of the Father. 
The Apostle Paul wrote, In being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Humanity has to suffer. Children, obey your parents. Here is Jesus, the Son of God, perfectly becoming obedient to the will of God the Father. So when we as children, or when we as people, are not obey, obeying even our parents or obeying the Holy Father, Jesus did. He suffered in obedience to the will of the Father. It's God's will for us to be perfectly submitted to everything God has for us. We can't do that in our own strength. But Jesus did. He was perfectly submitted to the will of God at all times. This is a miracle. And his perfect obedience is applied to you by faith. He suffered because he humbled himself even being obedient to death. Well, let's go on to number three. Jesus suffered as your substitute. The book of Isaiah revealed to us, and we read this earlier, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, brings us peace. He suffered as your substitute. Again, the wrath he took upon himself and gives us peace. He brings us peace. But look also, wounds are healed. And even now, there's a present day application in part, looking forward to the complete fulfillment that your entire being will be made whole with everlasting life. There's an anticipation. So when you are healed right now, it's an anticipation, like an appetizer of greater things to come. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed for eternal life. And all sorrow and suffering will pass away. He did it as your substitute. He did it in your place. The New Testament writers emphasize this, that Jesus redeemed your life from meaninglessness. Look at how the Apostle Peter writes here. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. A few weeks ago, we went into this in more detail. But when Jesus took up the cup, remember what he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So his precious blood is poured out. We can't save anyone else, but Jesus' precious blood, perfect blood, is poured out for the forgiveness of our sins and for all who believe. But look into this passage and we find out that, you know, we think about all the wonderful things that unbelievers have done in the world, maybe cures even for disease, wonderful architecture, some of it still survives from like the pyramids and from ancient uh, Rome and, and uh, the Greek architecture and all of that. All of these things that they discovered and Peter is just not impressed by the Holy Spirit, he says it's an empty way of life. That's very humbling, but that is the word of God to us. Without Jesus, your life is an empty way of life. It has no lasting value. It might last for two or three, even thousand years, the accomplishments. But where is the Tower of Babel? It's gone. Yeah. Yeah. And many of these other civilizations are gone. We don't even have the languages of some of them, of these civilizations. It's an empty way of life without Christ Jesus. The contrast is that with Jesus, you're redeemed from that. Your life really counts for all eternity. And what you do now in loving one another, in helping one another, in giving of your gifts and resources for the kingdom of God is going to last. It's going to have value. 
and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to contribute to the kingdom of God. We need to know that our life has meaning. Without that, we just kind of give up. Jesus has redeemed your life from meaninglessness. And he has called you into the wonderful family of God that's going to last forever. Well, we're going to go on. But I do want to see, have you see some of this. That the apostles that were there in the garden, like Peter and others, they wrote about this. Jesus' suffering was not meaningless there. It counted for you in your place. Jesus suffered to defend you. Look at what the Apostle John wrote. My dear children, see how you're elevated right there. You're lifted up. I write this so that you'll not sin. But if anybody does sin, seems kind of humorous there, of course we're going to sin. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So precious that way. Jesus suffered to defend you. The enemy will come against you, even now, even if you're a believer, and the will, enemy will stir up trouble against you, your conscience, your memory, and say, Oh, remember back there in May 19, 1978? Remember what you did that day? Oh, yeah. God can't possibly forgive you. And here is the work of Jesus right now, defending you, speaking to the Father in your, your defense. So there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The enemy can't touch you. He is, Jesus is, your defense. He comes to your aid. And when others accuse you, when the enemy accuse you, when you're, you feel terrible about the past, Jesus' atoning sacrifice takes away the sin of the world. Don't go back to it. Don't go back to feeling guilty. You don't need to. He's our defense. Claim the blood of Christ. When I was in seventh grade, uh, in the first quarter of the year, uh, it was a big class, 35 class, uh, and uh, uh, English class, yes. Oh, one of the, the uh, distinguishing marks of this particular English class was you had to have an English notebook, and it was very fat. It was the largest notebook I ever had for any of my high school. And in there, we had numbered pages, and you had to put them all in the right order and have them in notebook. And, the teacher took a grade for that. And I went home, I had all my papers in my notebook, but I, my report card came out with a C. And I tried to explain to the teacher that I had the papers right there in the notebook, but she said, no, no, you do not, you do not. And I went home and my parents uh, really were pretty strong about this. Why did you get a C? And, English. We know you can speak well. We've taught you well. And we're both, um, you know, graduates of different institutions. We know that you're doing just fine. What's going on? And I said, well, I have my papers there, but I've just pulled these four papers out because it was kind of like syllabus, and I put them into the back cover. My dad took up my defense, went to the teacher on his own time, went into the school, and he said, I don't know what he said. But you know, he'd been there. He passed seventh grade. He'd been there through uh, college. He passed that, Berkshire Christian College. He'd been to seminary. He passed the graduate school. He wrote a book. He had all this kind of stuff going on. He knew how to speak. He spoke every day, up in, in, uh, every Sunday in public. My dad came to my defense because he'd been there. And my grade got changed somehow, back to an A. And the teacher and I actually became friends after that. And uh, I worked hard for her, and, and she understood where I was coming from. But even greater than a grade on a report card, Jesus comes to our defense. The teacher wouldn't listen to me. I didn't have it. Yeah, I'm a seventh grader. The enemy won't listen to you, but the enemy can't touch you because you're in Jesus Christ. He comes to your defense. 
Jesus willingly came and comes to your defense. Well, let's go on, finish up our little work here. In your place, remember these things. As great as it is to look at the passage and recognize there's this uh, uh, suffering of Jesus going on, don't make it just kind of like a history lesson. Apply it right to you because that's what the New Testament writers do. Jesus suffered the great anguish there in the Garden of Gethsemane on the coming hours of crucifixion. He took the wrath of your sin. It was against you. He took it. Jesus perfectly obeys the Father's will. And that righteousness is applied to you. Jesus became our substitute out of love. He redeemed your life from meaninglessness, and he gives you meaning right now, and he's going to keep defending you, and he's going to return for you. You're not going to be left as an orphan. So when you take up the cup, and when you take up the wafer here, the piece of bread, just a few moments. Remember, Jesus took it in your place. He took the pain, the agony, the suffering, and even the death that was supposed to be for you. And he died in your place out of great love. And there is a purpose. Redeeming you. Redeeming you from what you can't do. He did for you. Let's bow in prayer. Lord in heaven, these things take a lifetime for us to assimilate, to remember, to inculcate into our being. Apply them to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And give a meaning for each one's life here that goes beyond personal wishes and satisfaction and lifestyle and anything like that. Give us meaning and purpose and let there be a great glory uh, uh, and praise to you through each one here that has a witness that lasts for all eternity till we can be right with you for all eternity, Lord. Be glorified in your people. Forgive us again of our sins and allow us to experience your grace anew. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing this song that thinks of, helps us think about Calvary and the suffering of the cross. Lead me to Calvary. <laughs>
sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. My fault. My fault. As we go to the communion time, you might want to peel back the top layer first and just to reveal the piece of bread. Jesus reminded us that this is my body, which is broken for you. Jesus wanted to know that there was a cost. And when we go through this communion time, this celebration of the Lord's Supper, we remember that Jesus' body was broken for you. Broken for you. Brother Mike Cox, if you pray the prayer upon the broken said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and we explored this cup of redemption. He didn't drink the final cup. That will be at the second coming, figuratively, in the marriage supper of the Lamb, cup of redemption we drink today because Jesus drank it. The cup, you know, in the, uh, uh, the passage, and that's the wrath of God, the cup of suffering. And applied to Jesus, he took it for you. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the precious blood of Jesus poured out for the forgiveness of sin. May more and more people experience this forgiveness of their sins and the joy of eternal life. May new life be given because your life was given. Lord Jesus, thank you for entering the Garden of Gethsemane, this suffering for us, becoming the second Adam, First Adam entered into the Garden of Eden and fell to temptation. You entered into the Garden of Gethsemane and triumphed over the temptation. You took it for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless as we take and remember in Jesus' name. Amen. Said this is, Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for do this in remembrance of me. He wanted you to get it. He wanted you to have this memory, taking it in. Take it in. Take it in. Young people, take it in. That's why you're here. We take it in together. Jesus said, this is the body. Let's stand as the body of Christ now. Body is also called the family, household of faith. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family.